we are live. This is the first time that this show, the show, is being broadcast live. It is July 7th. This is Dave Hart. He's a creator of sound landscapes, and he's also a master in multiple genres of guitar. Tara Keeping will have a feature chat with him later on in the show, and she'll also look at Nanaimo real estate trends. Also in the lineup, John Barsby supports Japan, and well, Shaw is supporting John Barsby. Our Victoria colleague Dan Kahn is here all the way, well, from Victoria, and he's going to sort of see what we do, get a feel for how things go with the show, because they might recreate their version of it down in Victoria. And since imitation is the highest form of flattery, we are thrilled to have Dan with us today. Dunya Tozzi is talking with Kimberly Plumley about social media. It's what these two ladies do best. That's later on in the program. And we also have Tom Piros here. He's going to shed some light on the seriousness and the frequency of cyber bullying and online predators that is a big problem with our youth today. Keltfest is coming up. Renee Cousin is here with his bagpipes. We'll be treated to some performance and an interview later. Carolyn Phillips Cousin is also standing by and she's going to fill us in on everything that is Keltfest. I'm Kate Bergen and this is The Show live on July 7th. Renee Cusson is in popular demand as a piping teacher, recitalist, judge, and dance piper and composer. He's got 27 years experience and we'll chat with him later in the show. But first, Carolyn Phillips Cusson is here. She's the artistic director with the uh, Celtic Performing Arts. Okay. Now, Keltfest is coming up July 16th to the 22nd. It's your 11th year. And I must say, it, it's hard to get a sense. There is so much going on. And I get, it's a balance between uh, pure enjoyment of performance mm -hmm. and educational um, opportunities for Celtic dancers and performers. Tell me, tell me the concept. Well, Kate, I think the concept really is to bring something to the island that we don't normally see, point one. Um, also to create a cultural event that embraces the Celtic culture kind of pretty well in its entirety, at least the cultural arts. You is know, there a big following? Is there actually more than you think? Yeah. Um, we're embracing ourselves to host, um, uh, I think, our 18th country this year. Wow. And uh, we're hosting people for the school side that we know of because they have to register, all the way from Saudi Arabia. Um, people also from Denver, Colorado. Coming to Nanaimo exactly. for Exactly, New Zealand, yeah, and Victoria. <laughs> Tell me a bit about the Celtic Performing Arts. Is, is this is a nonprofit organization, it's it a is. school it as is. well? Yeah, it's, um, it grew out of a school that we created a concert series on top of it and the whole festival. So um, with all this great talent that comes from outside, um, everything from pipes to fiddle to guitar, accordion this year, um, uh, bagpipes, you've heard those, and yeah. all the Highland and Irish dancers and people that are coming, it's going to be a great party. So um, the object is to share and uh, not only the people that have been enrolled um, from all over are coming, but also the public can come in and do quite a bit of things this year and how many add on to them. How many people involved with, with students enrolled, the public that come out, the staff, right. the volunteers behind the scenes, how many people are involved with this? Well, for the core of people that are actually sort of kaleying during the week as part yeah. of the school, it's somewhere around 300 we figure. Okay. But what happens is we get into the venues like the Port Theatre where we have the finale. Um, you know, we're getting upwards of, if you were to keep totaling, it's probably 1,200. You know? Wow. Yeah. One of the big um, kudos for this year, the City of Nanaimo has declared it Celtic Heritage Week Correct. and that kicks off next week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, a week. First time thing? It is a first yeah. time thing to bring everything all out the open. You'll see um, Celtica um, as displayed through uh, a, a walk from Diana Krall Plaza with the mayor. Um, Rene Cusson will be playing the pipes and his entourage. And, uh, his, we'll entourage. his entourage. <laughs> we all need an entourage, which will don't we? Which nameless, yes. <laughs> we'll, we have to have a little surprise here and there. Yeah. And uh, they'll be marching down to Maffeo Sutton Park. And I think I'm seeing that actually. Uh, yes. So I'm really, I'm really glad to be hearing these details right now. <laughs> Good. 
<laughs> we thought we'd brief you in on yeah. live TV. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, so um, it'll be a show. There'll be mostly local Celtic artists. Um, yeah. We're planning on having Yvonne Hernandez and uh, Jeremy Walsh from Victoria, a master fiddler, and she's been a, a finalist in uh, the um, fiddle, Grand Fiddle Championships, Grand Masters Fiddle Championships. So we'll have only be importing some talent for that occasion from Victoria. But uh, by and large, it'll be local, um, local people that will be entertaining us from uh, musicians to dancers. Uh, the Mount uh, Kaylee, sorry, the Mount Benson Kaylee Band should be there opening, and uh, the band Trinitude will also be part of it. So I went online and just picked up a few highlights of mm -hmm. the many, many events. How many events are taken? Well, it depends on how you count them. Right, really. it's There's hard quite to track. a lot. <laughs> There's um, everything from Gaelic um, Gaelic song and language workshops, which mm -hmm. the public can come into on the Thursday, uh, to things during the week that include things like Boran the Irish drum. Um, people can come in and learn how to step dance. Um, Breton step dancing, so Canada has its own brand of Celtica, that's for sure, and certainly in the dancing world. Um, penny whistle, um, there's just a lot of things that you could come in and do and take part of. Um, and I and think something's happening. Oh, We're being a part of something right now. <laughs> what, Car Carolyn, what is this? Well, I think we're seeing a little flash of the Celt about now. Flash of the Celt? Yes, okay, we'll enjoy a, it and figure out what it is in a minute. Mini Celtic flash mob. <laughs> Celtic flash mob, I love it. <laughs> There's so many people applauding. We, we just got Celtically flashed by a flash mob of Celtic we performers. We did, and I think that's an omen of things to come downtown during uh, Celtic Heritage Week Let coming we up next week. Be downtown, somebody comes up and it breaks out beside you. Who's to know? You know, let's you kind of have to be there. Let's give credit to the girls. Who did yes, we just see? We just saw Delaney O'Toole, who's um, from the O'Connor School, O'Connor O'Brien School of Irish Dance. Um, who actually trains here with my school, Glengarry School of uh, Celtic Dance, and uh, she is um, she's an alma, alma mater, a uh, longtime uh, student of Celtfest, as well as Katrina, who played the fiddle, and she's also been a, a student at Celtfest, and her friend uh, um, Ayana. Great, so, yeah, excellent. One of the things I sort of pulled off the internet was a wacky jig and hornpipe contest. Mm -hmm. What is that? Well. <laughs> It's uh, serious fun, but non-serious competition. Um, the only criteria is that the entertainers perform either a jig or a hornpipe, or both, and they can use their imagination from there. They choose a theme, and there's some pretty crazy fun that entails. It's lots of fun. We've got about just under two minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, big sunset and gala coming up at the end. Is that on the 22nd at the Port Theatre? It is and the 21st, I believe. The 21st, Thursday. that's right. Yeah, Thursday. And we have some graphics coming up later that yes. will confirm that and tell people where they can go for more information. The list of performers coming to perform and participate mm -hmm. this year is huge. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to give us a little brag list? Well, it's, can a, we? it's a big roster. Yeah. Um, we have uh, the headliners pretty well are the Outside Track, which is a five-piece band from Scotland. Um, all, this, all the players are pretty well in their 20s, uh, quite young. Uh, fantastic group that uh, met each other at the University of Limerick, and then they've just been taking the Celtic world by storm. And they're called the Outside Track. They, even, they have two Canadians in it. That's what's That's really good, neat. Yeah. Um, two Scots. Two Irish Scottish girls, uh, two Scottish girls from um, uh, Edinburgh and um, the Highlands. Uh, there's a boy from Ireland by the name of Killian O'Daly. And the two Canadians in it are um, Maddie Rankin, who's a cousin of the, the Rankin family, as we all know, uh, from Cape Breton. Mm -hmm. And she's no stranger to Kelp Fest. We're happy to have her back. I'm going to interject really quickly because yeah. we have about 30 sure. seconds left. You I only live, got I'm, I'm getting people. a wrap. <laughs> so we're oh, only four. <laughs> you live and breathe there's 40 this, people. Carolyn. Yes. You live and breathe it. Mm -hmm. Why do you love this so much? And I'm only giving you 10 seconds it's to explain. It's just the passion. That's all yeah. I can say. 
it's the Celtic heart and uh, it's the love of life and fun and that's really what the Celtic culture is about. Is it safe to say that bagpipes are are us <laughs> are a part of that heart, Big are time, integral, yes. and that's a little segue Former into competitive Highland dancer. It sort of is, is in there. Yes, <laughs> we're going to send things outside again now to Renee Cuson for some of that heart and soul of everything that is Celtic. Hi, I'm Malvin from English Entertainment, I'm inviting you to watch English Entertainment's Big Summer on Shaw TV. Follow the fun and the sun on English Entertainment's Big Summer as we uncover and introduce you to some of Vancouver Island's hidden gems that might be worth a closer look. Come explore what Vancouver Island has to offer. Join us on English Entertainment's Big Summer, weekly on Shaw TV, Channel 4. Hi, I'm Al Decoto from Terminals Quality Assured Collision Services, inviting you to watch Terminals Quality Assured Collision Service Arts Now. With music, theater, and entertainment in your community. Whoa, whoa. From local bands and actors on stage to the talented work of artists in the Mid Island area. Know what's happening when and where so you won't miss a thing. Terminal Quality Assured Collision Arts Now, only on Shaw TV. Hi, I'm Steve Wallace, inviting you to watch Wallace Driving School Crime Stoppers, only on Shaw TV. Arson, assault, break and enter, all crimes committed in Manaimoan area, and through reenactments of these and other unsolved cases, the Crime Stoppers program hopes to find the answers. With your help, the program not only helps resolve criminal activity, but also increases public awareness. Wallace Driving School Crime Stoppers, only on Shaw TV. And now, back to the show, only on Shaw TV. has been somewhat of an interesting year. Uh, we started off the year, I think, a lot better than a lot of people anticipated, and we thought maybe we were poised for a really strong year. Then we kind of stumbled a little bit in the springtime. But, uh, you know, you read the news out there, and some people are saying it's a slow market, but to put things into perspective, to date, in the last six months, there's been over 600 houses sold in Nanaimo. So, you know, for sellers, it is really positive. Houses are still selling. We may, may not be selling the same amount as we were you know, five or six years ago, but definitely things are moving. And how about the recession of 09? Have we recovered nicely the markets because of that recession? That is a very popular question. <laughs> the, you know, I think it really depends where you ask that question from. Uh, you know, I can only speak to Nanaimo. Uh, as far as where we were towards the end of 2007 through the recession, we've definitely recovered in terms of the price and actually a little bit better. But uh, it's, you know, real estate markets are, are a funny thing. The best explanation I've ever heard is real estate is a lot like playing with a yo-yo while walking upstairs. <laughs> you know, there's going to be some ups and downs, but overall, the long term, things do generally always go up. Because what goes down must go up. We like to think so. <laughs> now, how about the, the lending criteria? Because I know because of the recession and especially what happened down in the States that the criteria has changed. Can you give us some of the changes? Definitely. Uh, yeah, there's been a number of changes over the last uh, couple of years. Some of the major ones is they have changed some of the amortization periods right. on um, government insured mortgages have been changed from 35 years down to 30. They've also increased the interest rate that you need to qualify at to a five-year term opposed to the three-year term. 
and uh, you've also seen things like the equity that you can pull out of your house has been changed down to 85% from 90. Um, and as well, investment properties have been, uh, the down payment required for them is now 20% instead of five. Oh. So you can imagine how much more investors are having to put out of pocket to get into an investment. And also because we know in Vancouver, it's a little bit of a different market over here, but uh, there's a lot of foreign investment, namely the, the Asian community. Do we see that over here in Nanaimo? This is a beautiful place to live, and there's no question why people like to move this way. Uh, definitely, BC has been well served in the last couple of years, uh, particularly by the Olympics. It was a two week yes. showcase of, of the beautiful province we live in. Most people, when they're moving to this area, they're focus focusing more on the larger centers like Vancouver and, and to a lesser extent Victoria. But once they do get settled here and they spend some time and get to know the place, places of surrounding, they mm -hmm. start turning their eye to different markets like Nanaimo, where you know the average house price in Nanaimo, based on last month's stats, was 370,000. You can bear that to about 630 in Victoria and close to 900,000 in Vancouver. That's Value your dollar goes a long way here. Right, and is there any tips? Like we're kind of wrapping up here quickly here, and I'm just wondering, is there any tips? Because we can sit and talk about this for a while. There's so yeah, much information that you've, you've given us, but is there tips for first time home buyers or just uh, home buyers in general and for selling, for sellers? Well, there's there's tons of tips, and uh, you know, as far as buyers go, uh, just quickly, a couple of the best things they can do is first, before you go out to buy a house, make sure you go and talk to your bank right. to get a pre-approval so you know how much you have to spend. And the second part is make sure you select a realtor that's going to work really well with you and and make sure they're working for you in your best interest right who's a good fit for you I guess absolutely well thank you so much Braden for being here and if you have any more questions for Braden you can he can be reached at Braden Wecroft at dot ca or uh, dot ca, Braden Braden dot ca. .ca. or hub city realtor on Twitter there you go and so we're gonna uh, it's back to Kate who's outside here, but it's not it's nice it looked so hot out here when we saw Renee playing his bagpipes, but you know what? It's it's breezy and it's actually quite lovely to be outside. And we are live on July 7th outside of the uh, Shaw Studios on Boban Drive, 4316. And we've been enjoying little snippets here and there, the talents of Renee Cuson on. And all I'm going to say is a bagpipe because I didn't know that there were more than one kind of bagpipe, but of course there is. First of all, Renee, maybe tell us about this particular bagpipe. Well, this is a Scottish Highland bagpipe, and uh, probably the best known of the bagpipes. And uh, this set was made back in the uh, early 1900s by the firm of Henderson in Scotland, who made a lot of great bagpipes. And um, it's the loudest. Well, this is more than 100, 100 years old. This is this. This, this set is more than 100 years old. Yeah. Oh. And uh, back in the day when they're making some really great instruments in, in a lot of different instrument areas. And uh, yeah, th this is uh, a Highland bagpipe, the loudest of the bagpipe family. <laughs> Good thing we didn't put you inside. No, no, that's, that's right. You know, it was right to have it outside. It was designed for the outdoors and we've got it appropriately there, so. And there are ones that are designed for indoors because you coming into the studio without completely disrupting everything that goes on here at Shaw would have been a possibility with the right pipes. That's true. And uh, there are lots of quieter pipes. In fact, I guess the majority of pipes in the world are somewhat quieter than the Highland bagpipe. And uh, in Canada, we actually have our own bagpipes too. And uh, they're very much like Canadians. They sound like they're sitting on the fence, but they're a lovely, pleasant little sound and so on. If we'd had time today, I would have played them for you. I, I saw in your bio that you're in high demand. How busy are you and for what is in demand when it comes to a, a bagpipe expert? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. Bagpipes are one of those instruments that uh, they say you either love or you hate, but there must be a lot of lovers of them because they're always phoning for these things. And you never know whether it's some dignitary coming to town or whether it's somebody just wanting pipes at a, a family gathering. Uh, you never know what's around the corner, but it, it runs the gamut. And uh, in fact, I've even been called to perform with uh, notable musicians like Carlos Nunez. Never know what's coming up. It's interesting that you say people either love it or hate it. I, I admit that I'm a little bit neutral because to me they sort of all sound the same and I'm only saying that because I don't think I'm alone and I don't mean it to be insulting but I, when I was talking to some colleagues saying that we had bagpipes they were very excited. They love them and, and it took me to a different place of types of music, genres of music that you can create on the bagpipe that I obviously don't know about. It, true, it, you know, it's uh, they, they, they have a number of different voices, believe it or not, for an instrument that's just loud and proud, but it, uh, everybody's affected by this instrument. You know, there's there's nobody who is sort of middle middle of the road. They either like them or hate them, but they, they certainly notice they're there. And Carolyn referred to the soul of, yeah. of Celtic heritage. It, well, the pipes are very much that because all the music that we have in Celtic music, especially of the Scottish and Irish background, uh, come originally from the bagpipes.
You're leading a Piper's March on July the 16th that kicks off Celtic Heritage Week in Nanaimo that also kicks off the Celt Fest. Um, tell me a bit about what that experience will be like. Well, I think it should be a lot of fun. I believe we're starting at Diana Crawl Plaza and uh, John Rattan, uh, rumor has it, is going to throw his kilt on and we'll be following along behind the pipes. So we'll make it a fairly long walk. I guess if I slow down too much, John can give me a wee nudge, but uh, should be good. And, how, and you just, the more people behind you, the better. You, you create a spontaneous parade I and take everyone down. Then down to the park. I hope so. What do you love about it? I asked Carolyn, I didn't give her enough time to answer. What is, you live and breathe this, I can tell why. You know, again, who knows why. From the time I was born, my mother says that I would just get ecstatic every time I saw the bagpipes. I have no Scottish heritage. Amazing, eh? And yet, here I am. I still love it as much now as I, I did as a young child. And yeah. there who knows? We're not. We're going to hear more of you playing a bit later on. Um, it's obviously not ready to go. You've got a mouthpiece that you put on it. Is that how it works? Well, that's right. You got to blow these things up. They're not one of those just plug and play kind of instruments. Okay. Yeah, it takes a little bit of winding, as they call it. So your lungs are in pretty good shape. I think so. And I imagine it's a very difficult instrument to learn. You know, it's actually, people make more of that than there is. It's, it really is about as hard as any other instrument to learn the basics, but it's the blowing, getting onto that. But there are enough of us doing it, so it's doable. Renee, thank you for being here oh, today. Thanks, Kate. It was and a pleasure. we will hear more of Renee and his bagpipes a bit later on in the program. In the meantime, it's time to head back inside to the studio where Dunya Tozi is hanging out with the lovely, the talented Kimberly Plumley. It's our social media scene. Thanks, Kate. Well, it feels so festive here today with all the bagpipes and the guitars, but we are changing gear. We're talking social media. Well, actually, in fact, we're talking podcasting. Yay. And here to talk about podcasting, we have Kim Plumley, who's uh, of Publicity Mavens. Yes. She's very, very well known in the social media scene, and she's kind of like, I'd like to call you as the social butterfly or social media butterfly. Uh, we'll stick with social butterfly. I'm good <laughs> with that because I go everywhere. <laughs> pretty much everywhere. Yeah. I, I don't think anybody doesn't know Kim. <laughs> so pretty much the whole of Nanaimo knows Kim. I hope so, so. I, as long as we have fun doing it, <laughs> that's all I want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we're talking podcasting. I know yes. that you have. Well, you're very. You have a blog. You are a publicist, but you also have a podcast. Yes. And uh, it's got a yummy name. It's called Garlic and Plum Jam. Dot com and we <laughs> podcast that way. A crazy guy, Bobby, who I work with, his last name is Garlic, and my last name is Plumley. So somebody at a bar said, "Hey, it's Garlic and Plum." So that's hence what our name is. <laughs> yeah. So, so before we go into your mm -hmm. podcast, uh, can we talk about what podcasting is? You know, well, podcasting is just a medium in which you get to talk. So it's it, you've done blogging, um, you've done video, as we're doing right now, um, and you could do it audio. So it's your own sort of little radio station or television station. So you get to do that in your own you know realm that you want to do. It and it, you know, on your own terms, so it's really quite fun. Well, that's pretty cool. Anybody yeah. can do that, pretty much. Pretty much, if you can speak coherently, which I work at every day. Um, I and if you have uh, headphones or and you have a medium which to tape it, record it, um, download whatever, you can do it. And you guys have been doing this since last November. That's when you started, and I can see I'm following it. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty popular. So can well, you talk about what you guys do in there? What do you well, talk about? Bobby and I, we met um, in a bar, and somebody asked us some questions. And I started spouting off, and he started spouting off. And we went, oh, we're interesting. What we like is content. It's not necessarily about social media, because regardless if you're doing Twitter or Facebook or blogging or your podcasting, you have to have a story. Right? You mm -hmm. have to have a story to tell, like you're doing and, and what we're doing here today. You need that story. So to discover that and talk about brainstorming and ideas and what companies can do to build um, their profile within communities and things like that, that's what we were interested in. How do people do that? So we like to hear ideas, tell ideas, and just, and then also talk about some recipes. We're a little bit eclectic, but it's fun. And you do it long distance, I, I, we do I heard. do it via <laughs> Skype. Um, we've always done our interviews via Skype. I'm usually in my pajamas. Sometimes I've had laryngitis. I'm in bed and he's working from home and we're working from home and we're just do it by Skype we have a, a, a time that we set that we make our podcasting time we come up with our theme um, sometimes we ramble I know the first episodes we <laughs> certainly rambled and then we sort of make it a little more cohesive and then we started asking questions out on the social media realm and personally when we've met people what's interesting to you as a business what has that business done to gain um, some attention and what's good and what's bad and what's ugly and we talk about that and um, we discover new ideas and we share ideas and that's really exciting and lately I, I maybe last month you went to the Victoria social media conference and you had a really neat thing can we you talk did. about that well I'll tell you how we got it's social media camp that's the new sort of conference lingo right is camp 
And I thought, oh, I have no cash to go to that camp. How do I get in? Bobby goes, oh, we should just take a tent and go camping. I go, oh, hang on. So I phoned the organizer and said, can we bring a tent in and do a podcast tent? And they go, yeah, okay. So we got a big tent, and that's on social media again. We went and asked for a tent. Um, Katie Homey sent, uh, gave us a tent. Um, uh, Fergus Gibson gave us a tree. And so we set this huge um, tent up, and we had all the fire stuff. We had marshmallows. We had the whole thing down. But inside was a full-blown studio. And we had mics. We had the mixing board. We had everything. And we had lineups of people, sorry, hit the mic, um, <laughs> lineups of people coming through just to talk to us. We met amazing people, amazing, <laughs> amazing people. That's time. awesome. That's really great. Unfortunately, <laughs> again, we run out of time. Oh, There's no. so much to talk about. Uh, but if you'd like to get in touch with Kim, you can, well, get in touch with her through the podcast, which is, uh, what, what's your Garlic podcast? Garlicandplumjam.com. <laughs> That's great. And she's also on Twitter, at Kim Plumley. Yes. And thank you so much, Kim. And now we're going to, up next, you're going to have uh, a segment about a cyber we're bullying, but for now, we, we're throwing to uh, Dave Hart. characteristics she's stupid stupid and ugly everything she does is ugly watch her eat watch her stuff her face look at her greasy hair dirty fingernails it makes me want to vomit get a life patty thank you that we pulled off of YouTube uh, to, uh, that aims to get the message out about cyber bullying, that it is very, very real and very, very harmful. The internet is a daily part of life for almost everyone, especially teens and preteens. Um, I think we could underestimate in our generation how, just how integral socializing online is to their social, social culture and uh, to their everyday life. All too often though, that online socializing can be dangerous and it can affect them in negative ways for the rest of their lives. Tom Piros is the Safe School Coordinator with School District 68 and Constable Sherry Wade is a Nanaimo RCMP school liaison and they're here to to shed some light and give us some help and guidance on what we can do and what we need to know about cyberbullying. Tom, let's start with you. How big of a problem is this? Well, first of all, thank you for having us here today. Our pleasure. It's, it's, it's an honor to be here on your on your launch. Uh, cyber safety and cyberbullying is a big topic in our culture. And the reality of it is, if we looked at Nanaimo right now in our schools, is that there's many wonderful things in regards to learning and the technology and all those aspects, but with it also comes a dark side. And what we're learning right now with our youth and in our school communities from our uh, research is that approximately 80 to 90 percent in students in grades 5 to 7 have a Facebook account. And the minimum age is 13 years of age to protect uh, children from anything from a, uh, a predator to other students that may try to harm that child um, through the aspect of, uh, of, of cyberbullying, which essentially uh, traditional forms of bullying was more overt. We could see it. Right. Now with uh, the forms of cyberbullying, a lot of it happens outside of school, but it plays itself out in the school community. And hence our, our youth are um, pretty well um, at risk 24-7. And they, it, because the devices are in their pockets, they're experiencing it in the classrooms. And you're, you're a safe school coordinator. This bullying doesn't really have anything to do with the school environment. But it's, as you mentioned, it's taken into the classroom and it does become a school problem in that sense. And that's the reality of what yeah. we're finding right now is that uh, the traditional sort of dust ups and things that we would have, uh, you know, at the elementary, middle or high school levels is really getting replaced from the, uh, again, from our research from our secondary administrators. They're saying about 80 to 90 percent of their office referrals, there's an initial phase that's playing out on Facebook, Twitter, cell phones, through technology, 
and then because the school is, is really the melting pot in our community still, is that um, the administrator, the teacher, the counselor has to deal with it because it, it often we deal with the end results, be it the violent acts or intimidation, bullying and harassment that um, can make it you know difficult in the school in the school environment. So do the, does it always sort of end up, does it matter if it moves from the online environment, the cyber world, into the real world? Is it, do, do you know what I'm, I mean? It's uh, if someone's being harassed, bullied, online, if it's not happening to them and their real person. They it, think it's real though. Right, it's, it's, no less it's no harmful. less no harmful. No, it's no less harmful because they're, um, when you talk to especially teens and you sit down and you say, now, do you know the person who's saying these things about you? No. Well, how does that, how does mm -hmm. that affect you if you don't know them? Well, they're saying this about me, they're saying this about me, my friends can see it, so it must be true. So they have a really hard mm -hmm. time removing themselves. As adults, we look at it and go, you don't know this person, so they can't hurt you. Right. But it becomes very real. And because everyone else can see it, then it affects how they see themselves. So it's it's very damaging. More public. More public. In a way than face-to-face, yeah. -face old-fashioned yeah. bullying was. Does it always show itself in the in a physical, real-world way? Well, that, that or, or does it sort of stay online a lot of the time? Well, that's if one you can of the differentiate the two, yeah. I don't. You can't separate. There's one. Of, that's one of the eventualities, and right. hence, up until recent times, we've been much more reactive, where the police would get called or I would get called in, following be it an act of violence or intimidation, mm -hmm. and now our real work is. That's why we, you know, with the school district, from the management and our our local union, we've really aligned our sources with our community partners to take a proactive preventative approach where we go in with the RCMP, work with colleagues like Shaw uh, that provide the services to communicate and share with the community that um, we need to know about these things before they escalate. Because right now, when we work from that reactive phase, we're having a lot of our youth that are you know, potentially being harmed. Mm -hmm. What what role, what can you do about it? If, if I'm a parent and my... Oh, 10 year old 11 year old 12 year old is experiencing something like this do i have any recourse legally your computer should be in a public space so i i go to classrooms and i'll ask kids in grade four who has a laptop who's got grade it in four. there yeah who's got it in their bedroom so i said okay well i hate to br you know ruin your day but i'm going to tell the principal to put in the next newsletter it has to be in the kitchen and mm -hmm. they flip but it's not their computer but their sense of ownership of it of that technology, so it has to be behind closed doors. The next question would be, what are you doing that you don't want your parents to see? So right. the computer needs to be visible, and you, we as parents have to be not afraid to say, what are you doing? Show me what you're doing. Who are you talking to? How do you know this person in Portugal? You just have to get creative and inquisitive about what your kids are doing and have rules. And it, it's not a matter of trusting your kid. No. Your, your, your child could be doing everything right, but the point is that people can access them and that you cannot control. Well, and kids are just naturally curious. So right. even if they don't mean to do something wrong, they're just curious. And then the problem with cyberbullying is everybody's anonymous. So you send me a, a hateful message about Tom, mm -hmm. and I just think, oh, okay, and I add to it and pass it on. So I had to teach our kids to stop it. Stop and report what was being said about Tom. Don't just pass it on because nobody knows who you are. Mm -hmm. And then who do you report it to? You Facebook or Twitter is inappropriate? Well, that's a great question. And, and I think that if we step back for a moment, what we're finding is we ha we're having a culture d disconnect in the sense that uh, the generation that I grew up with, uh, we find that uh, many of my friends and colleagues and so forth weren't brought up with technology. Well, Facebook was cool till my mom signed on. Yeah, You've heard that, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's a very good analogy. Um, what we find is, again, from our research, is it's showing us that uh, with the the number of handhelds and the toys the kids have, a lot of the big companies uh, are are targeting kids as young as four to get the handhelds and mm -hmm. the Nintendos, all the great toys, which have so many positives. However, with that comes a high level of responsibility. Yeah. Facebook was created for adults children don't have the tools or filtering abilities to wean that out. So what we find right now is about 15% of the parents are really aware what their kids are doing online. Only In 15%. other words, cyberbullying and those forms of harassment, um, there's a disconnect there of parents being really aware. So Sherry's points there about keeping our computers in a public place. Having the, the most powerful thing now is having that communication with your children, where you're not there just to pro them. However, Parents, what we encourage, parent. 
Right. What we encourage with our schools is right now, and, and uh, Sherry's colleague points this out, the internet is no longer the Wild West. There are limits, there are boundaries. We're changing our school codes of conduct. We're working on establishing now from K through nine and then 10 through 12 curriculum, tools, and um, making it like year round. Like we talk about uh, every day is Earth Day. We're looking at upon every day should be Pink Earth Day or we should be aware of what our youth are doing. But with that, we have to get the community on board with it. The RCMP just can't solve it. The school district can't. We have to work with our parents, with our community partners, with mm -hmm. players like Shaw, mm -hmm. in regards to uh, to giving the tools to an ever-changing technology. 18 months ago, we weren't talking about Facebook. Right. We were talking just cyberbullying. Facebook is front and center now in regards to where our youth are simply socializing. Right. They're socializing through handhelds, through through uh, the through texting. Uh, the traditional phone and those outlets, it's dated. Email addresses are dated. They are using the newest toys and tablets and how to communicate. With that being said, a lot of classes and, and things are being delivered in a high-tech fashion, so we have to keep up with that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? We just Don't can't throw the reactive. baby out with the bathwater. You, you have to take the good but try to limit the bad you and You can't promote out. fear. You can't promote fear. Yeah. Education, knowledge, that's where our power is now. And educating, we've only got about a minute left. I feel like yep. we're just getting started. Um, educating parents, it can be a lot of these, these preteens, teens, youth that we're talking about have never known a world without the internet. It, it's synonymous with their reality. However, three generations ago, or two generations, these parents are quite intimidated by this technology yes. that moves so fast. I would imagine one of the tips that you can do, one of the things that you can do as a parent is is learn yourself. Absolutely. Know what you're talk up against. Internet provider about their, everybody's got parental controls, so talk to your internet provider about that. Check your history, check the children's history on the, anything they've bookmarked, check their history, what are they browsing, and just yeah. keep talking. Tell me about this site. Why did you go to that site? And get them to tell you what they're doing so that you've, you've got mm. that dialogue. We used to think television yeah. was a bad babysitter. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> it's right. looking pretty good now. Yes. Well, now the television talks back to you. Yes. That's the reality. And with yeah. that, we really encourage our community to get involved with your schools. Be aware that uh, we're offering a lot of town hall-like meetings at schools during the course of the school year uh, to discuss these topics, to give tools, and yeah. uh, to become aware. And that's where we feel the real strength is here, is that uh, as we work together on these initiatives, that's where we're finding the change, is we're getting youth to report prior to the crises, telling their parents prior to things getting out of control. I'm getting the rap sign as you can see me looking over my shoulder. <laughs> that 10 minutes just flew by. We will have you back again, Tom. Uh, Sherry, thank you for coming in. If you want some information on at least where to start, a good resource that Tom passed on was www.cybertip.ca. Summer is upon us now. Your kids have an awful lot of free time. Uh, get involved, move that computer out of their bedroom into the living room and uh, participate in what they're doing. Call us here at Shaw and find out what you can do as a parent to enable some parental locks and controls on your computers. Keep your kids safe. We're going to check in again with Tara Keeping, who's going to have a feature interview with Dave Hart. But first, we're going to leave you with one more reminder, another public service announcement that we downloaded from YouTube that uh, illustrates how easy it is for your child to become a victim. Hey Jen, how's it going? Hi Mark, good. Parents are out of town having a party. Be cool to finally meet you. You can bring a friend if you want. When, where? Friday at eight. 5100 Brunson Drive. Cool, see ya. See you. And now, back to the show only on Shaw TV. And finally, we have Dave Hart with
with Dave Hart Music. And I'm just gonna use my cheat sheet here because I don't wanna miss anything out. Tell me if I, if I get anything wrong there, Dave. Dave is a solo instrumentalist. He's featuring popular songs, world themes on classical and hybrid guitars, uh, blending smooth jazz, Latin, new age, and electrical blues. Did I miss anything out? Well, there's, uh, you know, there's uh, the rest of my entire story and musical development, but we'll, we'll skip that for now. <laughs> so I think you've encapsulated it quite well. So what is your story? Well, my story started many years ago, 1977. Do I have this much time? <laughs> my first two concerts were uh, Kiss and Alice Cooper. The same month. I was, you know, 13. Very greatly influenced by, by so much musical activity. I wanted to be a guitar player. So I tried it, and over time, I think approximately 24,000 hours to date. Wow. Yeah. And you're who's counting? Who's counting, exactly. And you're fairly new to the Nanaimo area. Approximately three years. Three years. Yeah. Okay, so what brought you out here to Nanaimo, well, besides you know, the beauty of it? <laughs> the part was the uh, witness relocation program, being that the RCMP was so kind to uh, let me stay here today. I appreciate that. Uh, and as you can tell, Dave has a really good sense of humor. <laughs> You know what, I actually have a question. What is a hybrid guitar? When I think of hybrid, I think of Go Green. I think of uh, the Green Movement. Right, like a half battery, half diesel. Uh, or a car. Diesel. So what is a hybrid guitar then? Well, this is a classical guitar, not necessarily a hybrid. Oh, okay. A hybrid is usually an acoustic guitar that has electric uh, functionality as well. And I use that at different events. And uh, speaking of events, you can see a lot of them at uh, DaveHartMusic.com. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wink, I wink. Do, I do a plug there. Yeah. Uh, so a hybrid is just a combination of guitars, so you can play electric blues, oh, okay. smooth jazz, play some funk, play rock, play a little bit more mm. range than just sounding, you know, just classical. Which is the classical here. So talking about events, upcoming events, what are some upcoming events that you are partaking in? Well, again, Tara, if you go to DaveHartMusic.com, <laughs> click on the event, but some of the uh, quickly upcoming ones, let's see, Parksville, Qualicum Beach, uh, on July 15th, I'll be there with a uh, very lovely singer named Mina. The uh, duo is called Thrive, mm -hmm. and it's a very interesting mix of uh, vocal and guitar playing a whole bunch of different songs. Also up in Courtney the following week, uh, July 22, 23, the uh, convention center at the uh, Best Western in Courtney. Okay. And uh, what's the week after that? Uh, Lusquiti Island, one of the best oh, wow. festivals this side of, uh, wow, the Kootenays. Well, you are busy, that's for sure. And I know also, because I've seen you at, uh, where you have regular gigs, I know you were at Manzavino's. Are you still doing that where you're playing at restaurants? There's a couple of select restaurants oh. around town. I, I've recently uh, been familiar with the, the Mix, which is a bit nor northern location. I, I think that helps, because not often people can, can go downtown. Right. So it's moving around a little bit. Uh, but often the summer has a bit more uh, private events, and also the uh, the Cowichan Valley is now new. Could you play something for us now, then? I thought I was done with that. <laughs> no. <laughs> so should we do something that we can dance to? Yeah, something fun, sure. Something fun. I like a little more of a like a bolero. Okay. It's kind of like this. Can you knock on this? I can. Do you want me to do that? One, okay. two, three, hit it. type of life. It's all about celebrating life. And you can also play without <laughs> strumming. The thing about music, it's so universal. You can use it anywhere. And it's great with food. It's great with friends. Yes. And Probably nice wine, maybe, yeah. perhaps. Or tequila. <laughs> And I'm Andrew McLean, and we're Oza McLean at Royal LePage. We invite you to watch Oza McLean's Two Men and Their Fishing Rods. Only on Shaw TV. Another lost lake. Just waiting to be discovered. 
but most importantly, fished. O's and McLean's, two men and their fishing rods on Shaw TV, Channel 4. She's a three-year-old spayed female, and she loves to chat a lot. Yeah. So if you're looking for somebody to have a conversation with, she might be your gal. She's really quite a personality, and she um, would love to spend some time with you, and she wants you to come down and visit so she can have somebody to talk to. Please come down and visit her at our shelter uh, from the 11 to 4, Tuesday through Saturday, at the Parksville, Qualcomm Beach and District, BCSPCA. race of the year and no matter what i was gonna win and that's when i realized that some things are more important than winning including others pass it on a message from the foundation for a better life Hi, I'm Joe Cunningham, inviting you to watch Joe Cunningham Ford's The Enthusiast. This show will rev you up as various fast cars are featured. From Porsches to Lamborghinis and everything in between, host Jeff Hill will take you under the hood and into the seat of these classic cars to show you why they're so hot on the road. Joe Cunningham Ford's The Enthusiast, only on Shaw TV. And now, back to the show, only on Shaw TV. Hi there. Got your HST referendum voting package yet? We're hearing that some people are complaining that the HST referendum is too complicated. Complicated? Really? Let's have a look, shall we? And you can rest assured that our government spent many tax dollars hiring consultants to ensure that the question is simple. When you think of the BC government, think simple. Are you in favor of extinguishing the HST harmonized sales tax and reinstating the PST provincial sales tax in conjunction with the GST goods and services tax? What? <laughs> Let me try that again. We'll, we'll, we'll break it down, right? Okay. Are you in favor of extinguishing the HST? Extinguishing? Why, is it on fire? <laughs> okay, okay, forget all that. Basically, it's do you want to dump the HST and bring back the PST and the GST, right? Simple, right? Nothing to it. Okay. After you mark your ballot, you put it in the secrecy envelope. See that? The province wants you to feel secure. When you think of the BC government, think secrecy. There you go. Ballots in the envelope, all done. No, you're not. Oh, right, because then you have to put the secrecy envelope into the certification envelope, and then you have to sign it and put your birth date and your phone number on there. <laughs> Shouldn't that information be inside the secrecy envelope? <laughs> Anywho, once you've put your private, personal, confidential information on the outside of the certification envelope, you're all done, right? Not yet. Right, because once you put your ballot into the secret envelope, which goes into the certification envelope, you need to put it into this nice yellow envelope. <laughs> there you go. Nothing to it. So that's one ballot and four envelopes. Three of the envelopes you mail in, and the other one you put in the blue bag to recycle it so we don't cut down any more trees. When you think of the BC government, think saving trees. All there's left to do now is put the yellow envelope into a red mailbox. Easy peasy. Unless there's a postal lockout or a strike. When you think Canada, Okay, think okay. Ah. All right, in Victoria, working Dan's beat, I'm Dan Kahn. Why can't you be nice, huh? You're hurting now me. look what you've done. You're, You're so caught in there. Help. Why can't you just be nice? 
That was Dan Kahn, a senior reporter in Victoria with his friend Danny the Puppet. As you can see, Dan is a very creative, very talented, very experienced and, and quite witty uh, reporter that we have with us in our Victoria studio. And we're thrilled to have Dan with us today because, well, they're thinking about doing a similar show to this down in Victoria. And Dan's here learning the ropes about how to put together a one hour live studio production. So Dan, you've seen the show and the production of it up to this point. What do you think? Oh. Hi Kate. Oh no. <laughs> um, I remember someone in high school in college radio leaning over the mic going, are we live now? And Dan, you're not going to do that to me, are you? You didn't tell me this was live. Well, it is called The Show live at Shaw TV in Nanaimo. Wow. You've hey. done live before. Once. You should, I, yeah. I, I'd hit you, I'd tell you to wake up okay. and snap Sorry. out of it, All I right. can't reach you. I'm here. <laughs> You're here. This is Nanaimo. This is Nanaimo. I'm here. All your right. first time in our studio. Great. First time yes. here. Yeah. Welcome. It is great. Boy, this is a great studio. Way yeah. better than Victoria's. Uh, we got a cafe and everything. Well, you guys have more computers down there. Yeah, but they don't work. Um, you have more staff down there. Yeah, but, but I don't, they don't like work any either, of them. Right? <laughs> I don't like any. They don't get this in Victoria, do they? I don't like any of them. <laughs> No, they don't, but we're working on turning this into a more of a regional program. Maybe yeah. with you guys on board doing a show similar to yeah. it in Victoria. I know nothing about you. I've seen your stories. Um, I have no idea where you came from, how you got here. I was raised by wool. Uh-huh. And uh, no, um, <laughs> no, I was, uh, my parents were too poor to have me, so a neighbor had me. Right? Over for dinner every day? Um, no, um, <laughs> no, I am a prairie boy. Go Riders. Anyone? Anyone? Yes! Yeah! Um, from uh, Saskatchewan. And I came out here, actually I came out to the Nanaimo Parksville Qualcomm Beach area about 20 years ago. And I and said, said no thanks and left right away? I, I, no, I said I am never going back to the prairies again oh, because this was, this was, I know it's a cliche, but this is paradise. This yeah. is the place to be. So. Love it here. Where does your media background come from? You're, you're very um, good, and we enjoy your stories, oh, and you're you. very creative, and, and you have a, a very unique talent that you bring. Tell my boss. Okay. Um, Who is that you. these days? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, well, thank you. No, you know, it's the thing I love about Shaw is that we get to be creative. We get to have some fun. And when I was a kid, I loved TV. Right. Like, I just loved it. And then as I grew older, I thought, something's happening here. Like, TV's not that fun anymore. It's so serious. And mm -hmm. everybody's trying so hard to look intelligent. And it's like, but it's not fun. We're just people, exactly. right? Exactly. But my first day at Shaw, 10 years ago, this September, and this is not a joke, my first day was 9-11. Right. And I was like, is this what TV's going to be about? No thanks. Yeah. No. Um, but Did you go to school? Did you say that? I, I went to uh, I went to radio broadcasting school. Okay, you got then, the radio voice, that's for sure. Thank you very I much. I hear it on your voicemail. Thanks, Kate. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I did that, and then I got into advertising. I was an advertising writer for a lot of years, and then I did stand-up comedy. I became a stay-at-home oh, dad okay. for two and a half years, and I was doing stand-up comedy as well. But I hated the travel. I just right. could not. Just can't do it with kids. No. No. So then um, somebody told me about uh, the Daily in Victoria, and I went down there, and, and uh, they were looking for some guy who, to sweep up. So I took that <laughs> job right away. And, and anyway, that was how many years ago? That was 10 years ago. Okay. You have missed the whole experience that is the volunteer experience then. Yeah. I've been with Shaw on and off for, I don't even know, 15, 16 years in one form or another. And when I started, it was all volunteers yeah. creating shows like this, and a large portion of this program is produced by volunteers. And we're giving you today, Dan, a crash course in volunteering on a show like this. So Derek has a camera. You're volunteering. We're volunteering me to you. Be a volunteer. Have you held a camera before? Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This is Derek. Um, he's Hi, Derek. just going to basically doing? put a headset on you. Oh, put a, okay. Derek isn't mic'd, so we can't hear a lot. So I'm I'm, I'm kind of a non-camera person, but I'm going to be explaining to you. Uh, what I can about how it works. That's your intercom that will connect you to the director. I can't hear you, Kate. Will tell you what to do. You've got Sometime one ear. Sometimes I put headphones on the block. You got to put this on your shoulder. Okay. Okay. And you're attached to a cable here. And um, what? You're hurting me. I'm gonna stand up in a minute. Is okay. WCB and help him rest this? that right on his Ow. shoulder, Derek. I, I can see he doesn't do this very often. Now, what you want to do? This is your Zoom 
This is right, your zoom. Where? So figure out in and this? out. Yeah, what makes it closer Whoa. and farther away. Uh, I don't know if he's going to be in focus. There's a little ring here that's going to put you in me in Whoa. focus. Be kind on me, please, Dan. Um, there we go. So there you go. So I'm now going to ignore Howie on camera two Good idea. and talk to what we have dubbed as the Dan oh. Cam. Okay. I have no clue. I actually, I do. Ha I could see the program over here. So this is a volunteer course. Um, if you guys are going to recreate a program like this, you need to uh, teach about 16 volunteers all at once at the same time who just walk in the door how to do what you're doing, except way better. Is that possible? Uh, uh, how is it feeling? Okay, now your tally light just went off, so we now have a shot of you, and you look great. I'm feeling this car suits sick. you, except I don't see a whole lot of camera. Oh, careful there. What? <laughs> Where are you going, Dad? I don't know. <laughs> this thing weighs like 600 pounds. And this is a light one, I think. Really? Yeah, I think it's one of our light ones. Uh, so you can just get a feel for that. Don't volunteer. These it's, cameras are way too no, heavy. No, Dan, wrong message, okay? We want lots of volunteers to come into our studio, get involved in the volunteer program. You get to have tons of fun on live television. We will give you about this much training before you're thrown into the live situation. Uh, I don't know how they're going to do things down in Victoria. Dan, you need to take your experience with you today and share it with our colleagues down in Victoria. How do you, you think you can do that? Have you ever done camera work before? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Can't you tell? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't, you know. I don't know. I can just see him going down to the ground. It's a nice carpet there. Okay, uh, I don't know how long we're going to let this go. Oh, good, I was waiting for that rap sign and I just got it from Terry behind the scenes. So, uh, if that's not a, um, a great sales pitch for volunteering and creating a new live show, I don't know what it is. Dan, thank you for playing along today. Oh, no, thank and, you. And uh, I hope that we can work together more in the future and uh, that we'll see you guys doing a show and that maybe we can do some regional things together with our counterparts in Victoria because we all are all one programming region now on the entire Vancouver Island. We're going to switch things up entirely now. Back in May, we introduced you to a John Barsby secondary or well, community school student named Tally Campbell. He's got a very promising career ahead of him. Tally, uh, words of advice, stay away from Dan and where he might guide you in your future career. But uh, Through Together is amazing. Shaw is supporting what uh, Tally has led at his school, John Barsby Community School in Nanaimo. So here's a look back at that story that we did in May, and then we're back live in the studio with Tally and Doug Steele, our operations manager on North Vancouver Island. In October last year, Shaw proved that together is truly amazing, raising more than a million pounds of food across the country to fill local food banks. It was huge, but even a small yeah, so group of people can do amazing things, things by working together. Uh, I it's always about helping others, and, uh, and uh, Barsby uh, raised her hand last year for Haiti, and we raised, I think, over $2,000. And this year, obviously, with the crisis in Japan, we decided to, especially our sister school for Akawa being in the center of it, we wanted to raise money in, t in terms of helping them out. In what ways yet, we don't know yet. That's something the group will decide when the money actually comes in. Tally is an amazing kid, really. We're here in his bedroom looking over the extensive collection of newspaper articles and plaques that he's earned. I love sports. I love politics. I love people. I love planning events. I love broadcasting, writing. Yeah, getting involved is mainly my purpose. And he's doing all that and more right now. He has the Tally Campbell Report on YouTube. He hosts several radio shows that you can find links to at tallycampbell.com. And he's stepping down as the publisher and editor of the Barsby Bulletin. He started it a few years ago but wants to be an active student council member. His involvement in the school paper would be a conflict. Sometimes I will uh, not be able to sleep because there's so much going on. But in most terms, no, there's always um, great support behind me who always are ready to take on things that I can't do. Um, never been afraid yet. I, I love getting new events. I know some teachers have told me to stop and there's too much I'm doing, but um, in my eyes, there's never too much. Tally credits his grandfather for giving him a maturity and drive that's beyond his 16 years. They used to watch and read the news together instead of watching cartoons. He also says his three older siblings have helped to guide him in the right direction by showing him what not to do. You could say that Tally has a soft spot for the underdog, always willing to help others. I'm big on anti-bullying, so I normally take on those events if it's something to do with that. So this past year I did the uh, pink t-shirt day at our school and we had various people come in and obviously with Skills for Life I like to uh, 
acknowledge them that they are part of our school. And it seems that students and some teachers, even though they don't really say this, don't uh, acknowledge them a lot and seem like they're not a part of our school where it's my goal to let them know they are and we're all equal. One of Tally's many projects that he has on the go right now is John Barsby Supports Japan, a fundraiser for their sister school, Furukawa, in Japan's tsunami zone. Shaw will match any funds they raise because together is amazing. In Nanaimo for Shaw TV, I'm Kate Bergen. That was back in May at the beginning of the John Barsby Supports Japan campaign and working closely with Tally. He's really good on the texts. You're always getting little updates and things from Tally telling you how the campaign is going and working with him in the school because school is obviously now over and uh, summer is in full swing with summer vacation and the students. So we sort of set a deadline together of June 24th for a fundraising deadline and whenever money was raised before that date would be sent to a sister school uh, of John Barsby Community School in Japan because they were affected by the earthquakes a couple of months back. I don't remember offhand the name of that school, Telly. Furukawa. Furukawa. Yeah. Now, what did you do to raise money? We sold John Bar Sports Band t-shirts. We also did a barbecue sale, country grocers, and also lunchtime, anybody donating change, and if it's spare change, donate to us. Right. Well, we'll get into a little bit uh, how much was raised, and we have a presentation for you. You, as we covered in that story, you are so busy, and I'm sure you've got about five more projects on the go since this John Barsby Supports Japan. What, what's on your on your radar right now? Well, right now I'm working at Big Brothers and Big Sisters uh, through my scholarships internship job for the summer, and then also you sticking together, which is the world's longest street hockey game. Wow. When does that take place? That will take place next June. Next June, rather. Okay. Yeah. World's longest street hockey? Yeah. Okay. And I'm sure we're going to be getting phone calls and texts and emails about getting on board with that. Yes. Um, how much did you raise? We raised $853.57, I believe. Yeah, there was a lot of things. You guys did hope to raise a bit more. Yes, we did, but uh, due to time, we wouldn't have much time to do, and our group was rather small. So the time and how much how much, well, how much much people we had, yeah. we raised quite a bit. Yeah, and it's probably, the schools are busy. You need to involve the staff, and they everybody has to work together. Yes, it was a busy time. I, I was coming up June, so exam times, final marks coming in. So it was very busy for the staff and students. Yeah. And I keep using the word together, because this is part of the Together is Amazing campaign. That story just showed that we went huge. We went national in October last year as we filled the food banks across the country. And this is a good example how working together in a small grassroots community scale is also a wonderful experience. Doug Steele is our operations manager for the North Vancouver Island region, and he's, we're doing a grin and grab. He's here to present a check. <laughs> Thanks, and first off, I just wanted to thank the, uh, the students and staff and parents uh, at uh, Johns Barsby Community School for all their efforts in keeping uh, not only raising the funds but also keeping this issue alive. It's been a few months since the event and uh, people are living this tragedy every day and special thanks to Tally for really being a driver of this event so we're delighted uh, on behalf of uh, Shaw Cable to present you uh, Tally with a check for $860 which is a matching contribution for uh, the donations that you helped raise uh, for Johns Barsby and for Japanese Relief so Tally thank you very much. And thank you guys again for getting the story and helping us raise money. Thank Thank you. And it's so great. We have a live studio audience. So a round of applause, please, everybody, for, for Doug coming today and presenting a check and for Tally, everything that you do in the community. And thank you for coming on the show today. It was our inaugural live show. It's July 7th. The show does repeat on Saturdays at noon, Sundays at 9, Tuesdays at 7, and then again Thursdays at 4. And I think this is the first time I've actually got all of those air dates correct. We will be live again in another two weeks every other Thursday. We have a lot of information in our credit role as to how you can get involved as a volunteer or present some of uh, the things that you might be involved with as a member of this very wonderful community. We'd like to thank everybody for being on the show today. They get here early, they hang out, they, they give a lot of their time and it is a lot of fun. I can hear the bagpipes calling from outside. Renee Cuson will take us out. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.